Hello, welcome to Ticket to Qatar. I'm Tracy Holmes. A little later on in the program, we're going to sit down with one of the Qatari national football team members from the 1970s. He's watched his nation change from one of Bedouin pearl divers to one of the richest countries on the planet, now hosting one of the biggest events, the FIFA World Cup. A little later on, Lenny Soltis will take us through some of the state-of-the-art stadiums and Sam Lewis joins us for her analysis. But first, let's catch up with what's making news. Some of the biggest football nations have fallen. Saudi Arabia stunning Argentina. Japan shocking Germany. And Morocco holding the 2018 runners-up Croatia to a nil-all draw. But one thing remains consistent. Cristiano Ronaldo has become the first man to score at five consecutive World Cup tournaments. Politics and human rights discussions continue, but there's been a softening in the narrative. That we acknowledge the very worthy um, advances that have been made in the past 12 years and that we want to see that continue. And I've just returned from Qatar. Uh, we raise the issues of being a welcoming host nation and the Qataris are very keen uh, to do so. Iran's coach even had a quiet word to the BBC reporter. He said players from his country were always being asked about the protests in Iran. But why weren't English players questioned the same way? about the war in Iraq, for example. Meanwhile, Australia is preparing to take on Tunisia. Helping tourists from everywhere find their way around Qatar is Ramsey, who happens to be from Tunisia. So what's his tip? Tell me the score, uh, Australia-Tunisia. Maybe 1-0. To Australia? <laughs> Many people thought Qatar was too small to host a FIFA World Cup. There are others that completely disagree, thinking it's one of the biggest selling points because you can watch up to three games in a single day. And the stadiums themselves are state of the art, as Eleni Soltis reports. Qualifying for a FIFA World Cup involves a lot of globe trotting for players, even after qualifying. In 2014 in Brazil, the Socceroos travelled almost 3,000 kilometres between venues for their group matches. In 2018 in Russia, they notched up another couple of thousand kilometres. In Qatar, the furthest distance between stadiums is 55 kilometres, making this the most compact FIFA World Cup on record. Or as former Socceroo and now Qatari resident Tim Cahill puts it, Where have you ever seen to watch two or three games in a day? You know, this is going to be really, really special. In its 2010 bid, the Qatari delegation said their country is the centre of everything, with two billion people living within a four-hour flight radius of Doha. But flight paths aren't everything. Qatar has hot desert summers, and in its bid, Qatar pledged to develop pioneering cooling technology for its stadiums. No. I am not on top of a mountain. Qatar pulled it off with the help of Dr. Cool. The Iceman cometh. No, this guy, Sudan-born engineer Dr. Saud Abdul Ghani. We put the stadium in a, in, a, in a virtual environment, which is the computer, and we simulated every second for the last 30 years, the weather. Uh, weather file for Doha. Even though these stadiums can keep fans and players cool, the World Cup was eventually pushed back to Qatar's winter season, the prime time for club football. This really annoyed the European leagues. But football great and now a paid ambassador for Qatar's World Cup, David Beckham, is philosophical about it all. He reckons the players will be more fresh-faced for the tournament. The performances will be top level. In all, there are eight stadiums for the World Cup. And this was the other significant part of the Qatari bid. They've promised to dismantle parts of their stadiums and give away 170,000 seats for venues in developing nations. A true international legacy with no white elephants. The designs for these stadiums are unique as well. Their stadium 974, that's the international dialing code for Qatar and also the number of shipping containers used for the venue. They're all colour-coded for different purposes. Watch out for the silver ones. The VIP rooms, and that's my kind of container. Yeah, about that. The Qataris love their exclusive VIP quarters. You'd be forgiven for thinking this is a long walk through a luxury hotel. Oh, wait, there you go, a green pitch. 
they do play football here after all. This is Al Bayt Stadium, also known as The Tent. Some of the other stadiums have also adopted unofficial nicknames. This one was supposedly inspired by the hulls of a traditional pearl fishing boat. But some critics have pointed out the late Iraqi British architect Zaha Hadid found her inspiration elsewhere, which she denied. Yep, I see it. It's a fishing boat. It also looks very similar to her design for the Tokyo Olympic Stadium, the infamous bike helmet, which was eventually scrapped by the Tokyo Organising Committee in a cost-cutting exercise. In the lead-up to the tournament, these stadiums have been in the headlines for the wrong reasons, with an unknown number of migrant workers dying during Qatar's building spree. Now, with new legislation and workplace reforms, Qatar hopes the stadiums will become a positive symbol for the country, while we await the verdict from players and fans. So amongst all the um, tourist shops and amongst the coffee shops and amongst all the paraphernalia that uh, many of the World Cup soccer fans are no doubt going to find here, I'd like to take you inside one of the most interesting stores in Doha. Uh, the array of things that you will find in there, the collection of things that you will find in there. Um, I actually don't know how to describe it. It's phenomenal. And if we're lucky, we might even meet uh, the owner of the store who's got a pretty incredible story to tell about his own interactions um, and his life in sport in this country. Come inside. Well, I told you I'd take you inside the most interesting shop in Qatar. Every time I come to Qatar, I come back inside this shop and I learn more stories. The shop is owned by Saban. Saban, thank you very much for joining us today. You were a football player. You played in the national team in the 70s. Yes. There's been some debate about how strong football culture is in Qatar. Yes. Has it been here a long time? Yes, you know, the football in Qatar since you know more than the 40s started but in that time it was you know was, uh, unorganized in the beginning the football is coming when the when the oil companies is coming here uh, in the 40s and then uh, started growing up and everybody's you know is, uh, now is, uh, love football playing and loving footballs there has been a lot of criticism building up to qatar how do you feel about that and what is your message to people about that? Well, we are building a lot of things, you know, especially the, the people love each other. That's the main target of the hosting these games here. We like to see everybody happy, everybody in, in the peace, everybody think about his brother and his uh, other nation. They are equal, they are the same. They are, uh, we should make everybody happy, the happiness to be happy in the, in the whole life, to see the other people's happy also. And uh, we hope uh, everybody's uh, participating here in Qatar in different, you know, the, in the best ways. And uh, also, uh, you, we welcome everybody to be in Qatar. Everyone I've spoken to has said they feel very welcome, so thank you for that. Tell me about this shop. It has bits of everything from all over the world. I've even seen something from the 1936 Olympics. I've seen a cover with the magazine of Pele, the greatest footballer of all time, many people would say. There's even a Sydney Olympic torch from my country. How did this start? And, and this must bring lots of stories to you and lots of people to you. Every, actually, my, my, my shops here, they call it Al Ajawid. <clears throat> and uh, I'm collecting a lot of things start with uh, collecting my heritage of state of Qatar because you know it's our heritage uh, part of the sea everybody's here in Qatar long time ago before gas and oil everybody working in the sea and uh, for the pearl diving and then starting with these things and then growing up also collecting from the other world from other things because I have nice eyes nice eyes looking for the nice thing beautiful things in the world and they collect it and now with my shops have a lot of things from the now for the for the certain moment i concentrated now i bring all my things from the boxes from the football from sport torches uh, flags uh, cards uh, tickets everything all things 
from the sport. I brought it for the people to see what I have. There is literally something in here from every place in the world and I imagine with the FIFA World Cup on there are people coming to visit your shop from every place in the world. So uh, this is a mini United Nations in, in the souk in Doha. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much to invite me for this uh, moment and uh, yes we are united. We like to be ready to be with each other. And now Doha, Qatar, I can call her the smallest, biggest city in the world. Because oh. very small, <laughs> but a lot of people now is here because join us happy uh, and peaceful. And, uh, and I hope everybody enjoy his time here in Qatar. Saban, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, joining me now to talk uh, tactics, as we always do this time of the program, Sam, the Socceroos, 4-1 <laughs> loss over France. They've mm. put that behind them. They've got to focus on Tunisia now, but it's a crucial game, isn't it? It is a crucial game. Usually, to get to the round of 16, you have to get results in at least two of your three group matches. So, unfortunately, the Socceroos weren't able to do that against France, and they now also have a bit of a goal deficit. So, Tunisia is shaping up as the absolute key clash for the Socceroos to try and get a serious result and to bring down their goal difference to hopefully move on to the round of 16 for just the second time in their history. But what do we know of Tunisia other than they come from a part of the world that is really having a, a dream run here at the World Cup? Absolutely, and if our experience is anything to go by, the Tunisian fans are going to be the 12th player on that pitch. <laughs> they are out in force here in Qatar. They are scary, they are exciting. It's really, really cool. What we know about Tunisia is that they come into the game against the Socceroos off the back of a pretty impressive performance against Denmark. They held them nil-nil. They were very defensive. They were very compact, very disciplined and very, very difficult to break down. So for the Socceroos, this is going to be a really big challenge for their attacking weapons. They need to be able to be creative, to be brave, to be flexible and to really take risks and try and get some serious goals from open play as well as from set pieces. Give us three quick names in the Socceroos that we should keep our eyes on for that. One big name coming back into the squad uh, from this afternoon from Graham Arnold is Aidan Frostich, a creative attacking midfielder, number 10. It was really good on set pieces, really good free kick taker. He's got a really um, fantastic eye for a pass. So watch out for him heading towards goal. I think another player who's really probably Due, overdue a goal maybe is Mitch Duke. He started against France and he ran and ran and ran his socks off. But against Tunisia, he's probably got the physical kind of edge. So being able to put him in front of goal on set pieces could be key. And another player, of course, off the back of his debut goal for the Socceroos against France is Craig Goodwin. He had an absolute blinder. He's got a wicked left foot. And if the game plan is going to be similar against Tunisia as what it was against France, then he is going to be absolutely key. I don't know if you can hear the helicopters buzzing <laughs> around us overhead. I wish I could give you the camera shot from the chopper. I'm not sure we can do that today. Um, but uh, just finally, it really does seem like at this World Cup, it's been so different. We've spoken about that so many times, yeah. but the tectonic plates in world football are shifting, aren't they? What they do, are. What are you seeing? What's really fascinating is seeing the rise of Asian teams at this tournament. We saw the upset against Argentina from Saudi Arabia, whose own fans were absolutely incredible. We saw Japan get an, an amazing 2-1 win over Germany. And we're starting to see more and more AFC teams start to push the usual traditional South American and European powerhouses. That's really exciting for Asian football. It's exciting for Australian football because these nations, particularly Saudi and Japan, they have invested in football in really serious ways over the past decade, not just in terms of money for players, but in terms of resourcing, in terms of pathways, in terms of facilities. So being able to see the outcome of all of that investment at this World Cup should give Australia a really important lesson in what we can use, particularly off the back of the Women's World Cup next year, as a springboard for the next 10 years of football development. Sam Lewis, keep on enjoying the World Cup and <laughs> we hope you do too. See you next time on Ticket to Qatar.